Ladies and gentlemen, we hear a lot about the rise of robots, don't we? Uh, what about the human impact on technology? Isn't it time that humans rose again? Well, Microsoft is here today to tell us yes. So would you please welcome Dave Coplin. Thanks, Jamie. Now, there's a really interesting dynamic playing out here. You'll notice all of the pres presenters from the last session have been standing in this space. And as you look back during the last couple of speeches, this side of the room is completely engaged. This side of the room is checking up on their email. So I'm going to flirt with disaster. I'm going to change convention. I'm going to present from both sides of the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I first have to introduce myself. I am Dave Coplin. I work for Microsoft, and I have a comedy job title. I am Microsoft UK's Chief Envisioning Officer. Check me out. The reason for the job title is really important, because I have a brilliant job. I have a job that isn't about technology and products, but it's about the human beings that use that technology. My job is about the future of what human beings are going to do, how they're going to live, how they're going to work, how they're going to play. So fundamentally, my job is about the future of humanity. And I figure if I'm going to have a job that's about the future of humanity, I deserve, nay, I demand a job title with a certain degree of pomposity. I think you'll see I've achieved that. Also, I told me mum when I was a kid, I said, mum, one day, I'm going to be CEO at Microsoft. You just watch me. Some of you will know there's recently been an opening for that position. This is still the only way I'm going to get that job title. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about this thing called the digital deluge, which is really the world we live in today, how technology shapes what we do. And I come at it from a very different perspective. I know that you'll find this hard to believe, but I have dedicated my entire career, some 20 odd years, to the IT industry. I have chosen to work for one of the world's largest technology companies. I have gone to the extremes of personal grooming to grow a beard and a ponytail. And I also quite like Star Trek. What a surprise. Star Trek's really important, right? Star Trek, when you're a young, naive, gullible kid like what I was, Star Trek teaches you that technology is supposed to be a force for good in our society. It's supposed to be something that enables human beings to achieve more than they could possibly achieve on their own. Now, my problem with that is I've spent 20 odd years in IT and I look around me and I don't see technology being this incredible release, this liberating force. I see a prison. I see technology has constrained how we work. It constrains how we think. It challenges us. It constrains what we want to do. And I refuse to accept that as our future. So last year, last time I came back to, to speak to you, I talked to you about this in the context of the future of work. I wrote a book called Business Reimagined, which is how work isn't working. The way we do work today is not working because, not because of bad technology, but because of us, the human beings, how we choose to use that technology. This year I'm back with my difficult second album, a new story about the digital deluge, and this is all about human beings. Now, I'm a cheap date, right? So you can get both of these books for free. If you have a Kindle, you can get them from Amazon. If you see me later on, I can give you a download link or I'll tweet it later on. But these are stories that are meant to provoke, meant to challenge the way that you think about technology. And I want to tell you the story about the digital deluge today. So this should be something that you recognize. This is the fire hose. We all live underneath the fire hose. We talk about it all the time. There's too much information, too many emails. Who, who doesn't, just show of hands, who doesn't get enough email today? I don't even have to invent a punchline for that. We get what that means. So we have this world of too much information and we run around saying, oh my God, I've got too much information. But there's a second dimension to the deluge which is these things, these wonderful, beautiful, engaging devices that we carry with us all the time. So yes, we live in a world of too much information, but now thanks to these wonderful mobile devices, I have access to too much information wherever I am, whatever I'm doing. We have started to fill every nook and cranny of available time that we have in our lives by accessing too much information. I don't know anybody who takes an elevator more than three floors who doesn't feel the urge to reach into their pocket and have a quick check of their email. This is the challenge, because the problem is it's starting to constrain how we think. It's disconnecting us from the environment, and it's disrupting our, our own cognitive processes, our ability to do more with technology. And to really get underneath this, I have to take you back to the 19th century, because we feel really stressed with our technology, right? We all feel this. And back in the 19th century, this is where it all started. And I'd like to blame, it's all his fault, right? Alexander Graham Bell. He bloody started it, right? He sat there in, the in 1876 and he had the most wonderful idea, the most wonderful invention. 
He enabled us to move from a world of machine-to-machine -machine communication. If you wanted to communicate in 1876, the way you did it was by having a human operator program a telex or a telegraph machine, which would send down pulses down a bit of copper wire to another machine, and it would be transcribed by a human. Alexander Graham Bell's invention was genius because it made us shift to a human-to-human -human experience. Now, thanks to him, I could engage in a very natural human thing. To, I could speak to people, but now I could speak to them when they're geographically separated. Absolutely brilliant. But we didn't stop there. We continued on. And how wonderful is it now that we live in this incredible world? I can stand on almost any street corner, and thanks to this device, I can talk to another person anywhere in the world, pretty much. But whilst Alexander Graham Bell's technology is brilliant for connecting people who are geographically separated, there's a knock-on effect that's happening to us in terms of it's starting to disconnect us from people who aren't geographically separated, people who are in the same room. And this technology is starting to disconnect us from the world around us. It disconnects us at work. How many of you work in an open plan office? How many of you sit in your open plan office at your desk and email the person sitting next to you? What time are we going for lunch? I don't know. Where are we going to go? I don't know. Technology has become a barrier to us. It prevents us from having a very human engagement. How many of you recognize this kind of picture? If you have kids, you will do. Let me tell you, family time in the Coplin household is a bit like this. We say, do you know what? Let's eat at the table for a change. That'd be nice. Come together as a family. We sit down. I get out my work phone. My son gets out his nameless tablet device. My wife sits there, think about it, think about it. Yeah, all right, we're there. And we sit in our own little digital worlds. We don't talk. We're just locked into the technology. How many of you have been to a public event, a concert, or a big sort of thing, I don't know, uh, New Year's Eve in Trafalgar Square, only to see hundreds, if not thousands, of people doing this, watching the event from a little glowing rectangle? I asked somebody about this who was doing this at an event. I said, why are you doing that? I said, it's all right, I've got an HD camera. <coughs> And I'm like, yeah, so have I. It's called my eyes. Right? So the technology is disconnecting us. And the thing is, as human beings, we've got to remember that we're but the first generation of a digital society. We are still learning the rules. We're learning the etiquette. And we've, we've developed four main coping mechanisms to deal with too much information and having access to too much information wherever we go. And these four coping mechanisms are the things that will prevent us from getting value from technology in the future. The first coping mechanism is skimming. We skim, read everything. We look for more and more information all the time. We never take time to go and think deeply. Don't let me read the book. I'm just going to search to find the chapter that I'm interested in or the quote that I'm looking for. I don't want the context of everything. I'm just going to skim across the surface. Coping mechanism number two is we snack. And there's a really interesting um, process that happens in our brains. Some of you may be familiar with something called dopamine, which is kind of like the brain's self-reward mechanism. When you do something that actually sort of promotes your, your survival, you get a little hit of dopamine, which makes you feel good. We've done lots of studies, and we've seen other research that shows when you acquire more information, you get a little dopamine hit. Oh, that felt nice. I'm going to do that again. And what's happening, given the access to too much information and all this technology, is we're spending all of our time snacking, asking for more. We would rather look for the next email, or look at another tweet, or click on the next link, then take time to think about how to respond to the last one. So we spend all of our time snacking on these empty calories of information without ever taking the time to really digest them. And then we use filters, and filters are really useful because filters help us separate the use useful from the useless. But the problem with filters is quite often we don't know when they're being applied. We're constantly being shown information that an algorithm thinks we will like. And whilst that's really helpful, because you've got to knife and fork your way through the data somehow, we're losing a sense of discovery. We're losing the power of serendipity. Because in a world where you only get shown what you like, how do you ever discover the stuff you don't know you like? So we have to be really careful. But the worst of all coping mechanisms is the lie of multitasking. Multitasking is a terrible thing. Now, it's interesting, right? Because we think today that multitask even as a male of the species, we think multitasking is a crucial survival skill for the 21st century. I need to be able to multitask to be able to cope with all of the pressures of modern living. 
Well, the reality is you have to remember that multitasking is an entirely computer-based concept. It was invented in the mid-60s by a bunch of computer scientists as a term to help them understand how they could get central processing units to be more efficient. Now, we human beings have adopted this because we think we can do this. The truth is, and again, we've done research, we've seen lots of others that show, on average, the average human being, male or female, is a third less efficient when they multitask. Because we don't do context switching, we struggle with it. And not only is, are we a third less efficient, there is actually a lag in the time it takes us to complete the distraction before we get back to the work that we were doing. Now, we did some experiments on our own people because we're like that. And we found that if you took an average software developer who was sitting there doing code all day, if they were distracted, when they got distracted, it would take them, on average, 23 minutes to return back to the work that they were doing, from the completion of the distraction to getting back to what they were doing. Because what was happening, remember that story I told you about dopamine, is once the distraction's finished, the body's saying, do you know what? Before I go back to that hard work, let's just go and check my email. Let's have a quick look at Twitter. See what the footy scores are doing. And you meander your way slowly back to the task at hand. And this is a crucial skill, right? We think our employers tell us that if we can multitask, we'll be more efficient. In reality, this is draining our productivity. It's belittling our power as human beings. And then finally, the really scary part of all of this is all of these coping mechanisms come together to start to change the way we think. Because of the way dopamine rewards us, we would rather seek out more information. Because of the fact we have these devices with us all the time, we would rather spend all of our time having too much information. People don't stop and think anymore unless you're walking the dog or taking a shower. I saw this lovely thing on Twitter a couple of months ago, and it's, the tweet simply said, sat next to this bloke on the train. He's not looking at a screen or nothing. He's just looking out the window. Hashtag nutter, right? Because this is the world we inhabit, right? And the truth is, we've got to remember, every time we pick up our device, we've got to be mindful of the consequence of what that is. We, uh, we have this experience. I have this ex uh, example as, as, of myself, right? So I'm a, a father to an eight-year-old lad, and I often will try and put him to bed at night. And I found this behavior creeping into my life because there's that moment between when he's in his pajamas and before he's in bed waiting for his story where he goes off to clean his teeth. Now, I would use that as an opportunity because basically I'm redundant at that point. I'd just have a quick look see what was going on at work, just check me work email. Now, if he was lucky, the best result he would get is a slightly distracted dad. By the time he's in bed waiting for his story, I'm now, I'm at work, right? The minute I pick up my phone, the minute I look at my email, I'm mentally no longer at home. But worst case, I get one of those awful emails, you know, the one from your boss or your colleague that just sends you into a froth of rage, and then he can forget his bloody story, right? Because you, you read your own bloody story, mate. I'm off to answer this, and bang, away we go. Now, I never made a mental decision. I never made a cognitive conscious decision to do that. I just thought I was checking my email. And it's this whole point about disconnecting us from the environment, disconnecting ourselves, that's really, really crucial. Now, again, I must emphasize, I'm not stupid, right? I work for a technology company. Understand, this is not about bad technology. This is about great services and great devices, but it's about bad usage. It's about the choices we make. And this is where we turn the story around, right? Because you've heard already today lots and lots about the power of the information, the data we have, you know, all around us, surrounds us. And we walk around complaining about the fact that we have too much information. Now, let me tell you, we're also talking about the fact that data and information are the very principles that will enable your businesses to survive and succeed. For us to live happy, prosperous lives, we will use, we need more data. So when we complain about having too much information, to me it's about like complaining about having too much money or too much chicken tikka, right? You just can't have enough of those things, right? And the reality is we've got to start to turn this around. You've got to start to learn to love and harness the digital dailies rather than hate it. And there are four areas where I really want you to think about this. The number one area is to think about the, the rise of what I call the rise of the connected customer. We live in an incredible world now where our customers are connected in a way that was never before possible. And yet still, we see them the same way that we saw them 10, 20, 30 years ago. Most organizations, they think about their customers in the, in the context of a single domain. And that domain, dom, domain, dimension, that dimension is simply about why is the customer here? What is it that they want to do? Why have they come to the website? Oh, they want to buy something. They want to uh, interact with a service. And organizations are pretty good at that. 
Some organizations venture into the second dimension. And the second dimension is understand what the hell what has the customer done historically? What have they done before? Amazon's a great example. When you log into Amazon, it shows you that, hey, welcome back, Dave. I see you've bought books on Batman. Would you like books on Spider-Man? But what's interestingly uh, important now, as we move into this connected world, is there are two more dimensions that we can start to access. The third dimension is this thing, this concept of the customer as a holistic human being. Because we see, there was a great report that the government did last year that showed that on average, we as human beings exhibit up to 10 to 12 different personas every single day. We haven't got multiple personality disorder, we all naturally do it, we have different affiliations. So I'm, just, I'm not just Dave the Microsoft employee, I'm Dave the dad, I'm Dave the motorcyclist, I'm Dave the ice hockey, all of these things are my identity. Now I will choose one of those personas to exhibit as my primary persona, given the context of anything that I do. And if you as an organization can understand that persona, can identify it, then you can start to tailor an experience. And I'm going to use Amazon as an example to show how this doesn't work today. Not because Amazon are rubbish. Amazon are actually pretty good at this. But it shows you how far we have to come. So I will, as a dutiful dad, I will buy my son his birthday present from Amazon, typically 48 hours before his birthday, because I've forgotten and left it till the last minute. I am a dad after all. And I will sit there and I'll buy him some Lego. Because I'm logging in and I'm David Dad at that point. Why is it a week after his birthday, when I go back into Amazon, the only thing Amazon wants to show me is more bloody Lego, right? I'm now back in a completely different persona, but the system sees me as one single thing. So we think if you can start to see your, uh, your customers more holistically, you can start to tailor the service. And then the final dimension is a social dimension. And we're used to conversations about this, right? We know the power of consumers with social media. There was my favorite story from the last couple of years, which is this, the uh, United Break Guitars story. Have any of you come across that story? A few of you. Basically, it was a scenario where Dave Carroll, a Canadian musician, he's traveling on an internal flight in the US. He's standing like we all do at the terminal, looking out on the tarmac, looking at the plane about to, that was about to be boarded. And on the tarmac, he can see a couple of United baggage handlers playing football with a guitar case. And he thought, bloody hell, look at that. And he looks a bit closer. Bloody hell, that's my guitar case. And he turns up at his destination, and sure enough, his guitar is smashed to pieces. So he phones up United and says, well, listen, you know, I'm a musician. That's a $3,500 Martin guitar. Um, you kind of ruined my livelihood. Could you, could you sort that out, please? Could you just fix my guitar? United say, no. He then does what every good musician would do in his position. He writes a funny song, creates a really hilarious music video, posts it on YouTube, gets a million hits in a very short period of time, creates lots and lots of bad PR for United, and of course, United capitulate. Now, most people are familiar with those kinds of social stories, and that's typically where people leave the United Break guitar story. But the economists went a step further. They looked at that event, they looked at the impact of that event, and wanted to assess the financial value to United of that single instance. And using some, to be fair, some fairly rough maths, they were able to show that that one individual wiped off $180 million of value, shareholder value, off the share price, United share price. This is the power that socially connected customers have. And that's the thing that we talk about, right? But the other side of the socially connected customer is actually when you start to look into their connections and you understand the relationship of people to people, you can start to deliver incredibly engaging and different services. I'll give you an example of how that might be important. So my day job at Microsoft, I work for Bing, the search engine, and we have a feature in the US, it's coming to the UK, that with your permission links your Facebook to your search results. So when you're searching for a restaurant, for example, you will see which of your friends have liked the restaurant's near you. And this is brilliant, as long as they're real people, not fake Facebook friends, right? So I had this example. I'm in London, <coughs> where my office is. I'm walking down the street. We had this service live in, in the, 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 for a couple of weeks in the UK to test. I'm walking down the street, and I'm looking for a sushi restaurant. So I type in sushi, and then I see the 10 nearest restaurants, because Bing's a good search engine. But then I start to see it augment which of my friends have liked the restaurants near me. And restaurant number two has been liked by a guy called Simon. Now, the thing about Simon, he was my best mate from school. We grew up together. We had a brilliant time. And we actually grew up in Derby, which some of you will know, in England, is pretty much as far away from the coast as you can get. Now, the thing about Simon, because he's a real friend, and I know him, I know that he actually never left the East Midlands. He's still there to this day, never traveled, never seen anything, never been anywhere else. So here's a guy recommending a restaurant in London who the only thing he knows about raw dead fish is when it's battered and deep fried, right? And he's telling me this is a good place to go. On, on the basis of my knowledge of him as a human being and that recommendation, I know I'm never going to that restaurant because it's bound to be crap, right? 
But this is the negative example, but you understand the power of these networks, about how understanding the relationship can change the experience. So we think the data exists out there. We will have lots of conversations about the availability of data. The challenge now is for your organizations to get yourself into a mindset, to equip yourself with some of the tools, to start to connect the dots, to start to look at this data and start to see what you're going to do about it, your customer services. But in order to do that, you have to connect your workers. And this is the next part of the solution, because actually what you need is an organization of people who are able to connect the dots, who are able to share knowledge openly and transparently, to think very differently about their role, not just in terms of their job description, but in terms of the overall objective of the company. And when you empower those people with the tools and the right kind of culture, they can start to collaborate very differently. There's a very big movement trying to get us away from email. It's not, I'm not saying to get off email. Email is really important and be around for a long time. But we use email today because it's kind of like the lowest common denominator. We need to look at different means. There are lots of enterprise social tools, things a bit like Twitter or Facebook for the enterprise, that are now enable your people to collaborate in a really open way such that other people can access and use the knowledge. And when you democratize your workforce in this way, wonderful things happen. But underneath all of this, and we've talked about it already so much this morning, is really understanding the value of the data that lies hidden, lies latent inside your organizations. And actually, you've got to start thinking really, really differently about that data. Most people think about their data in terms of, well, we'll use that data to get a bit more insight to what our customers do, maybe a bit more analysis to what our products are capable of. Well, actually, you're belittling the power of data because that data, the power of that data could transform your business. James talked about it earlier. The data there could be a new source of revenue for you. It could help you create new products or services. You could connect that data to disparate data sets and deliver new value. One of my favorite examples of this is insurance companies. Insurance companies know that if you're the type of consumer that buys those little felt pads to put on the bottom of your furniture to stop them scratching your floors, you are several times more likely to make your payments. You're a better customer for them. Disparate data sets being joined together to create new insight. And the third example is when you use data, when you're going to generate data, think about multiple uses. So you should be, for example, if you're putting CCTV into your stores, not just looking for shoplifters, but using that data to analyze footflow through your store. You're getting multiple hits from that data. But all of this is just a preamble to our future. And our future belongs to the machines. And our future belongs in particular to this thing called machine learning, which is essentially statistical-based pattern recognition. It's how the algorithms work. And the algorithms we use every day, like Search engines are a great example of this because they enable incredibly different services to be delivered. We demonstrated my favorite example of this just two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we demonstrated the power of language translation, which is essentially allowing someone in English to be talking to someone in German, and they're speaking English and they're hearing German. Incredible technology. We also have a Welsh translator as available as well. The way these technologies work, is that we all have a pattern in our mind, right? You can all read this text. You can see that actually, as long as I keep the first character and the last character in the same place, I can mix the letters up and you all understand what's being said. Now, the interesting thing is, if I showed, what do you think happens when I show someone who doesn't speak English that slide? They don't understand. And the challenge is we've all got this pattern inside our brains, which is how the algorithms help us work. So we look forward to this dystopian future where the algorithms do all the heavy lifting, the robots take over. Except we forget that these frameworks are fundamentally limited. My favorite example of this is if you think about IBM's Watson, IBM's Big Blue, respectively huge supercomputers, the world's best Jeopardy player, the world's best chess player. Incredible feats of computing technology. I could beat both of them with one ambi on me back at a game of Snap, because they don't have the pattern. They don't know how to play those games. And then there's this other thing called Moravec's paradox when we move into robotics that says, actually, the cognitive stuff that we think is really difficult, it's dead easy for a computer. If I were to ask you what's the, the answer to 47 divided by 13, that's a hard sum. How easy do you think that is for a computer? But conversely, if I were to throw a ball to you, you would catch it. Computer, robot, really struggles with those fine motor controls. So yes, we can build, build the world's best chess computer, can't pick up the bloody pieces, can't set up the board. So human beings are required, and this is where we move forward. And Jamie, I know I'm slightly overrunning, so I'm going to uh, be with you in just a second. Understand that if you want to deliver transformational experiences for your customers, you can only do that if you empower your employees to be transformational. And equally, they need access to the tools that will enable them to deliver that transformation. 
You need to be thinking not about organizations, but you need to be thinking about intelligent organisms. Because organisms, they, they're malleable, they change, they bend, they weave, depending on what your customers and your market is doing. You need to unleash the power that's hidden in your workforce. Stop thinking about your employees just in the domain of the job description they fulfill. Start looking, treating them as holistic, whole human beings. Understand all of the skills, all of the experiences, the bizarre, wacky, weird stuff they do on weekends, because that stuff has value to you as an organization. Create a data culture, not just in terms of hiring a bunch of data scientists, but make sure that everybody understands the power of data, that they are inquisitive, they have access to the tools to, to, to use the data to deliver new services. So for me, is this about the rise of the machines? Is technology going to take over? Absolutely not. Because there's a crucial story here about the role that humans provide. Our job as human beings is to put technology into its respectful place. We should be looking to stand on the shoulders of our digital giants, not to succumb to them. And I'll leave you with one final story from my childhood to kind of make the point. When I did my maths O level at school, now for those of you that don't know what an O level is, it's kind of like a GCSE but harder. Right? <laughs> Could I be any more patronizing? I don't know. And when I did my math O-level at school, it was a point in our society where we were debating the role of pocket calculators in education because they just become commercial, like, like cheaply available. They're a commodity item. Now, I did my math O-level with a bloody logbook and a slide rule. But let me tell you, I am a better mathematician with a calculator than I am with a tabulated bit of paper and a slidey bit of plastic. Yes, I need to know the basics of arithmetic, but I can use technology to lift me higher, to achieve more than I could have done on, on my own. The challenge we face with technology today is exactly the same. Our job is to figure out how do we leverage that, not to be constrained by it. How do we change our behaviors to change our working practice, to change what we think, the position we put technology in, make mindful choices and allow us, the humans, not the machines, to rise. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.